All right. Well, guys, once again, thank you so very much for for your attention. Thank you for coming on this call tonight. Um, I'm going to begin a a study tonight that could go for a go for a while, not in distance, not in time tonight. Even though I am going to take my time, but over the the course of just whenever there's an opportunity, I'm going to start something called comparative religions where I'm going to be talking about major world religions in our world. And I thought that tonight I would just begin with the subject of Islam. Now, this will be a very uh, 30,000 foot view of uh, the religion and where it comes from and the basic beliefs of it. I think that you're going to enjoy it. Um, So here we go. Uh, there are three world religions that are monotheistic. Uh, whenever I say monotheistic, what I mean is that there is they believe in only one God. It's not pluralistic. It is mono, mono one. Monotheism, the belief of one God. Those three world religions are, number one, Judaism. This began with Abraham. God treated him like a nomad by moving him around in search of the promised land. Uh, Christianity, is, and I'm talking about these in order of existence. Christianity, Jesus was born in a stable with a scent of sheep manure and shepherd sweat in the air. And then the third world religion that is the belief in one God is Islam. Islam is actually the second largest of all of the world religions. There are more than 1 billion Muslims in today's world. Being only 1,400 years old, having started around the 7th century, Islam is the youngest of all the major world religions. Uh, A growing Islamic presence in the United States did not begin until the mid to late 1800s. It's believed that the first mosque in the United States was constructed in 1934 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In compliance with their religious requirement to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in a lifetime, more than 2 million Muslims annually visit Mecca in the 12th month of the Muslim year. So where did it begin? Where did it start where did this um growing religious movement called islam begin so looking at the history of islam it began in ad 570 when a man by the name of muhammad was born in mecca which is now saudi arabia but in circ- but as circumstances would have it for little muhammad he began his life began bleakly and soon got worse his father died before he was born which caused his family business to crumble his mother died whenever he was 6 years old muhammad was shuffled off to live with his grandparents but his grandfather died there uh, shortly thereafter so young muhammad moved in with his uncle who was the head of the Quraysh clan, perhaps living with his uncle gave Muhammad some spiritual sensitivity, or maybe that came from the fact that people around him just kept dying. But this clan had a responsibility for the Kaaba, a, a Mecca shrine and place of pilgrimage in Arabia. While there were Jews and Christians in the area which exposed Muhammad to these religions, most of the residents of Mecca worship numerous gods, and they worship natural phenomena such as trees and rocks. Going on a pilgrimage and offering sacrifice were two main religious practices in this polyistic culture around him. When I say polyistic, I mean the belief of multiple gods. Tradition says that Muhammad could neither read nor write, but he had a knack for commerce. At the age of 25, he married a 40-year-old woman who owned a caravan business 
um, that he was managing. The newly eds made Mecca their home. Muhammad had set uh, to beginning a successful business career, but as it turned out, Muhammad was more of a thinker than a trader. He was disillusioned by the polytheistic and idolatrous practices around him, and he sought solitude in a cave outside of Mecca. He got to a point where he couldn't handle the worship of all of the one gods. And in 610, when Muhammad was 40 years old, he was sitting in a cave when he received his first series of mystical visions that changed his life and the world. Initially, Muhammad was unsure whether his visions were divine, but his wife was convinced that they were from God. So Muhammad eventually believed that the archangel Gabriel delivered God's message to him, that there were only that there was only one true God, and that idolatry was an abomination. For two years after Muhammad received his verse, first visions, he kept quiet. Then in AD six twelve, he began to preach, and he started making converts. Since he couldn't read or write, he would recite the revelation to his disciples who would write them down. And eventually, these transcribed uh, words were collected into a book called the Quran, which means the reciting or the reading. There is always a risk whenever you start talking about history and doctrines of other faiths to oversimplify in trying to summarize a belief of a religion. With most religions, it's difficult to reduce the major points of doctrine into, say, like five simple categories. However, it's easier with Islam because it has five fundamental doctrines. Although there are similar doctrinal categories and that you can compare with Judaism and Christianity, the specifics of Islamic doctrine would is way more different than you would expect. See, there's five pilgrims uh, or, or five pillars of the Islamic doctrine. Pillar number one is a declaration of faith. Um, this literally means to bear wit witness. It's called a sh shahadam, and every Muslim is expected to publicly recite it. In English translation, it says there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. This statement uh, acknowledges the Muslim's belief in God's unique oneness, eternity, and sovereignty, and it also acknowledges that man Muhammad is the top prophet. Repeating this phrase in Arabic throughout his life confirms a person's membership to the Islamic faith. The second one is oblig uh, an obligation of prayer. Prayer is the discipline most consistent Muslims practice because it shows an obedience to Allah. Prayer is a ritual carried out five times a day at dawn, at noon, midday, after sunset, and at night. Prayers must be said facing the holy city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. It can be done at home in a mosque at a convenient place, ex except on Fridays. On that day, Muslims must attend at the mosque at noon to say their prayers together. The, the third pillar is giving. You've probably heard the expression giving alms to the poor. Well, this is one of the five requirements of practicing Muslims. Zatka equals 2.5% of a person's income. The money is given to the Muslim community to, to benefit. Alms are also used as institutional administrative purposes in Islam, such as building mosques and salaries and, and whatnot. The next, the fourth pillar is fasting. Fasting can be done for in the month of Ramadan. Fasting can be done for reasons of piety or penance. Either way, Muslims observe an entire month of fasting. The ninth month of the Muslim lunar year, the same month that Muhammad received his first revelation of the Quran, fasting is serious business. As Muslims abstain from food and drink and pleasure from sunrise to sunset each day during the month, any eating must be accompanied after sunset and before dawn. And then the fifth pillar is a pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim dreams of making a pilgrimage to Mecca. This is not a fantasy trip. 
The Quran actually requires it at least once in a lifetime. Each year, millions of faithful Muslims descend on Mecca during the 12th month of the Islamic calendar year to accomplish the prescribed ritual of the pilgrimage, which includes praying vows and circling the Kaaba the, to Muslims. It's a symbol of global unity, and it represents everyone's equality before Allah. So that is a very large overview of their beliefs. Now, I want to get into some comparatives. There's some things that I want to compare. I want us to look at the origin of biblical Christianity versus the origin of Islam, of God, of key writings, Jesus, future judgments. These are things that we can look at and we can compare one belief to another. In biblical Christianity, the origin is simple. Jesus Christ, A.D. 30 to 33, that is where Christianity came from. It came from Jesus. Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinful life, died on the cross. And the scripture would go on to say they were first called Christians in Antioch. Muhammad, as I told the story earlier, was A.D. 570. Was he was born and he died in 632 AD. So that is the origin. God, what do we believe about God? G for biblical Christianity, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. For in, for in Islam, there is one God, which is Allah, and anything equal to Allah is worse is the worst sin in Islam. And Muslims identify Muhammad as the last of Allah's prophets. Key writings. For the for Christianity, the key writing for us is the Bible. It is the authoritative document in our lives. It is a breathing, living document that we are anchored to. The Bible is everything to us because we believe that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we believe that the Bible is the word of God. For Islam, they, they have the Quran, which is believed to be given to Muhammad from Allah through the Gabriel, Gabriel the angel. They also have a collection of savings and actions of Muhammad. They even, they even have a respect for the Bible especially the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels. Muslims believe that the Bible is a revelation from God, but it has errors that need to be corrected. When we believe that the Bible is absolutely perfect and inspired by God. Jesus Christ is another point of contention in the comparisons. Biblical Christianity believes that Jesus Christ is the one God manifested in the flesh. However, on the other hand, Islamic teaching is Jesus is not God manifested in the flesh. He's nothing more than a respected prophet and a teacher. He was, however, they believe, born of a virgin and did not sin. And some even believe that, G believe that Jesus was crucified, but he did not rise from the dead. He will return in judgment day for the purpose of turning Christians into followers of Islam. So that's where we differ on Jesus. The final judgment is also something that we differ on. Uh, if you were not on the call last week, uh, Brother Mike Zidor taught about the catching away of the church, and he spoke about the, the end time and the rapture and those things. And if you missed that lesson, I highly encourage you to go back and listen. But we believe that in the end, all people are going to be judged. Those who are declared righteous in Christ will be sinless before him, will worship and serve God for eternity. Those who have not trusted in Christ, not repented of their sins, not been identified with him in death, burial, and resurrection, will spend an eternity outside of the presence of God under God's condemnation. And for, for Muslims, like Jews and like Christians, they don't believe that, that physical death is the end of life. 
they believe that life includes a spiritual dimension that continues after death. Everyone who has ever lived will be resurrected from the dead at some unknown future time. When that happens, it will be the great day of judgment. Their Quran teaches that all human activities are written down by two angels. At the time of judgment, these two angels review the database on each individual. The actions of each person are weighed on a scale of absolute justice by Allah. The good deeds are balanced against the bad. The way to tip the scale, however, to be on the good side determines the person's eternal destiny. If the good deeds outweigh the bad ones, you go to heaven, the bad deeds are heavier, then you'll be spending eternity in a place of unimaginable suffering. There is one loophole, however, that would allow a Muslim and only a Muslim to avoid the judgment. Those who die a martyr's death in defense of the Islamic faith or in a holy war or a jihad go directly to heaven, avoid the uncertain outcome of waiting to see which ways the scales tip. So those are some of the comparatives that we have of biblical Christianity versus Islam. Now, the greatest comparative, however, that I want to share with you, the greatest comparative is one that the Muslims have 99 names for Allah, which they memorize. And each one describes his characteristics. But you might be surprised to learn that there is one characteristic that our God has that theirs does not. Missing from their massively long list of 99 beautiful names is one characteristic that we hang everything on. And that one characteristic is love. The Quran never describes Allah as loving. His character is defined as judgment rather than grace, power rather than mercy. Now that doesn't isn't to say that he doesn't love. He loves those who do good meaning that they do good deeds to adhere to the required daily practices of the five pillars. But he doesn't love a person whose bad deeds outweigh the good deeds. The attribute of love is the huge difference between Allah and the God of your Bible. That's why it's incorrect to believe that Allah and God are the same deity but are simply known by two different names, depending on whether you're sitting in a mosque or a church. But this isn't like calling a couch a, a sofa or a love seat. No, this is uh, Allah of the Quran only loves those that he deems good. But the God of our Bible so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The God of your Bible loves humanity and realizes there is none good but God. And he says, even in your sinful state, for whenever we were without righteousness and whenever we were in sin, the scripture says that Jesus died for the unrighteous. I am so thankful that we have a God that loved us and cared for us, even whenever, when, even whenever we didn't deserve it. Even whenever we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So whenever you're wondering, what is the difference between the two? What is the difference uh, in, in the Islamic faith and biblical Christianity, you can forget everything else. You can forget all of the, the technical things that like you say, we'll both pray, we'll both fast, we'll both give, we'll both, we'll both uh, have this or that. But if anyone asks you if there's a difference, all you've got to say is love is the answer. Love is the answer. Because you see, 
in biblical Christianity, God so loved the world that he gave. And every other world religion, it's not about what God gives humanity. It's about what humanity can do for God. And, and Jesus has flipped that, in, that entire narrative on his head and said, it's not about what humanity can do for me, but it's about what I can do for humanity. Before you ever believed, I'm going to give you the gift of salvation. Before you ever trusted me, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I am going to take the first step for you. The thing that separates Christianity from the Islamic faith is that we believe and we know that we are loved and can have a personal relationship with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't, a, a Muslim isn't going to have a relationship with their God. They just have step one, step two, step three to follow. But we believe that we can have such a relationship with him that we can talk to him. But And our talking to him isn't out of a ritualistic uh, um, duty, but rather it is out of a relationship that we have with him. Build that relationship with him. We are honored to be in that relationship with him. We'll find a spot to pray every day. And your prayer, to, you don't have to face a certain direction. You can just simply whisper the name of Jesus and he shows up. You can say, Jesus, uh, this isn't about, this isn't about the, um, me fulfilling a duty. This is about me needing to be in your presence and desiring to be in your presence. It's not just a certain five times a day. It's any time I need you, I can call your name and you're there for me. I am so thankful that I not that I have a re revelation and I'm so thankful that you have a revelation of number 1 who God is and what his name is and that he loves each and every one of you, us so what's the biggest difference between Allah and Jesus love is the answer what's love got to do with it everything everything everything. I'm thankful that I am loved by him. I'm so thankful that I am loved by him. Aren't you, is anybody else thankful that you're loved by him tonight? I wonder if Thank we can that. just, I wonder if we can just lift up our voices together and thank him for loving us and caring for us and allowing us to cast his, our cares upon him. The scripture says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you so very much for your people. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for caring for us. I thank you, Jesus, for the relationship that you have allowed us to have with you. For while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Whenever we were unworthy, you thought we were worthy. Whenever we weren't covered, you covered us. You have been so good to us, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving to us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for taking that first step. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us the path to salvation. God, thank you for allowing us to be buried with you in baptism. Thank you for filling us with the Holy Ghost. God, our hearts are grateful and thankful for your goodness and your kindness towards us. You are so good to us, Jesus. I pray a blessing upon your people. I pray that you will bless them and keep them. May your face shine upon them. Bring them peace and hope and goodness. Thank you for everything you've done. God, I pray that you will turn any sadness into dancing. I pray that you will turn any sickness into health. I pray that you will turn some things around, for you are a turnaround God. 
and you can do all things. You are the one true God, and beside you there is no other. There is no God beside you. There is no God in front of you or behind you. You are God, and you are God alone. You take counsel within your own self. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your oneness. We acknowledge who you are, and we are not we not only acknowledge it god but we receive it into our lives uh, and we s- receive the spirit of adoption that you have given us uh, you have not left us alone and you have not made us ju- you have told you have told us uh, to come to me you have told us that we can receive the spirit of adoption you have not just uh, you have made us your own You've not left us to our own devices. You have not left us to our own thoughts, but you have given us a name. You have given us a family. You have called us to follow you. We thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.